Now, what are we talking about today? Well, what I am going to talk about is who Geosyntech Consultants is. I'm going to give a brief introduction to Geosyntech and also to our presenter. And then I'm going to hand over to Tom, who's going to talk about all the good stuff today regarding the in-situ management of contaminated sediments using sediments. So you may be asking yourself, who is Geosyntech Consultants? Some of you know, some of you may not know. We are an international consultancy. We're 100% employee owned and just over 30 years old. Uh, we number approximately 1,000 employees working from 60 offices worldwide. The company was founded in the United States originally, but over the years has expanded to Canada, the UK, Australia, Malaysia, and we work slightly further abroad than that. Um, we put a lot of store into the people that we bring on board. We're very unapologetically selective with our hires and look for top-tier people within our organization. Those of you familiar with the environmental consulting industry, 1,000 people is, is not a large relative to some of the other consulting engineering firms, and that is, that is by plan. Uh, we, we really focus on, on excellent people able to provide top-tier client service, project management, and technology leadership. Now, being leaders in technology development and implementation does not necessarily mean that we are a more expensive consultancy. The use of cutting edge and newly developed technologies may mean that we provide a more cost-effective solution and a more efficient solution to some of the difficult problems that we face in contaminated lands, in ground engineering, in natural resource management and restoration. Now, Geosyntech operates across a range of industries. We are also a family of companies. We have three subsidiary They are firm to provide uh, advanced remediation technology development, so they do a lot of internal research and development for us. Uh, we also, they also offer commercial treatability studies a very high level service for um, bench scale laboratory studies and also um, a lot of work to bioremediation, so culturing of bio augmentation cultures and microbiological political services for assessing the uh, presence of uh, the right sort of um, microbial cultures within your sites. MMI operates in the area of safety engineering and risk management, um, a lot of work with onshore and offshore plant and structures, industrial facilities. And Savron is our newest company. Uh, Savron is the licensing company for a remediation technology that we have developed, uh, which operates on the basis of it's a thermal in-situ, well, in-situ in and ex-situ thermal technology uh, that operates on the basis of smoldering combustion, and that may well be a topic of a future webinar. One of the things we take a lot of pride in and that we, we feel sets us apart uh, within our industry is the fact that we are technology developers. Um, we invest a lot of time, a lot of effort into internal research and development, both to enhance existing technologies and also to introduce entirely new technologies to the market. Uh, our focus is on the intractable problems that conventional technologies have had limited success in treating or are prohibitively expensive and trying to find ways uh, applying cutting edge science and engineering to make these practical solutions. Uh, we work both in conjunction with industry and with 
government research organizations. Um, there's a, a list of the sorts of things that we have invested our, our time, money, and effort into. And uh, you'll see at the bottom of that list, amendments for sediment remediation, which is a segue to introduce our speaker. So our presenter today is Tom Krug. Tom is a principal engineer in our Guelph office, which is near Toronto in Canada. Tom has 30 years experience in environmental engineering consultancy. His focus is with innovative technologies for the remediation of a range of contaminants, including solvents, NAPL PCBs, metals, petroleum hydrocarbons, and PAHs, and in particular, the in situ application of those technologies for the remediation and treatment of groundwater, soil, and sediments. Um, Tom, being based in Guelph, it is about 9.15 p.m. his time, so Tom, thank you very much for making yourself available uh, on a somewhat awkward uh, time zone difference between here and there. Without further ado, Tom, I will just click the magic button to give you control, and then I will sit back and let you lead. Okay. Thanks very much, Lang. There we go. I can move on to the slides here. Thanks very much for the introduction, Lang. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with uh, with you folks around the other side of the world. You know, as Lang said, it's 9 o'clock at night here, so I've had supper, and um, we'll go to bed right after the uh, the seminar tonight when you guys have to work for the afternoon. Um, so this is a, a presentation that I've given a few times. It was developed um, mostly for clients in North America, so I apologize for some of the, the things in here that may be uh, North American or U.S. slanted. Um, some of the, the things that we see happening in the U.S. right now um, from my discussions with folks in Australia aren't, aren't quite reaching there yet, but I think that they will. They're taking hold in the, in the U.S. and in Canada, and I think that they're going to be spreading around in the Australian market, market soon as well. So these are uh, really up-and-coming um, approaches to dealing with, uh, with contaminated sediments. And the first question that I want to ask or put forward is, you know, why do we care about in situ treatment of, uh, of contaminated sediment? And uh, the short answer is that alternatives are expensive. Dredging, dredging is the alternative that's generally been used for contaminated sediment in the past, um, and there are uh, a lot of problems with that. It, it's expensive and can also create a lot of short-term exposure risks. By going down and attempting to dredge sediment, you tend to stir up sediment, uh, distribute contaminants into the water column, they get spread around, you don't really capture them, and there's often a very significant increased short-term risk associated with, with dredging of sediment. So with in-situ treatment, we can reduce the cost or reduce the risks associated with the chemicals that may be present in the sediment, and we can do it at a much lower cost, and we have very little risk of uh, increasing risk in the short term. We're not likely to distribute you know, stir contaminants up, spread them around, and make things worse in the in the short term. And what we're seeing in uh, in the U.S. and this is something that we we is seeing in Canada now as well. We think is will happen in Australia as well is an increasing acceptance of in situ treatment of sediment as an alternative to uh, to dredging or uh, or or capping isolation capping approaches. Um, so I'm going to talk here about some of the trends and opportunities that we see. And this is sort of the evolution of the, the um, or the thinking about how to deal with contaminated sediment uh, that's occurring in the U.S. and, as I said, I think will be happening in, in Australia as well as, uh, as Australia looks to some of the technical advances in, uh, in dealing with these problems in, in the U.S. The old paradigm with contaminated sediment has been that you need to uh, reduce concentrations in sediment because the concentrations of contaminants in the sediment determine the risk. And what is becoming recognized now or has become recognized over the last number of years is that it's not the concentration of contaminants in the sediment that's important, but it's the bioavailability of these contaminants that determines the risk. And that's really what's important. It doesn't really matter if you have a high concentration of PCBs in the sediment if they're completely sequestered and bound up in organics and are not working their way into the food chain. So that's really the important thing is what is the bioavailability of the contaminants. 
And one of the major documents in the states that came out back in 2011 from the uh, from a, a group of regulators who put out this document talking about incorporating bioavailability into management of contaminated sediment sites. And this was important because it set the stage and this was a group of regulators who said, yes, bioavailability is what's important. Um, other work has, uh, has come up related to this, looking at measuring pore water concentrations as an indicator of bioavailability and of toxicity. Um, it's important to look at the uh, the concentration of the contaminants that is in equilibrium with the contaminants that are on the solids, and that's really what determines the risk. So pore water is a good way to measure the, the bioavailability of contaminants in sediments. And uh, the slides here are from a, uh, a very recent course, online course that's being given by the EPA, looking at measuring pore water concentrations and bioavailability in contaminated sediments. And if you do a search on that, that title, you can get access to the, to the presentation material, and it gives very good technical background from the US EPA on the importance and of the relevance of measuring pore water and evaluating bioavailability when looking at contaminated sediments. Um, another guidance document that came out of the US EPA on uh, the use of passive samplers for measuring pore water concentrations in, uh, in se at sediment sites. This is a good guidance, a good reference if you're looking at measuring pore water. And then back uh, just last year, the EPA put out a guidance document where they were specifically talking about the use of amendments to reduce bioavailability and risk at contaminated sediment sites. This document doesn't have a huge amount of technical information, but it's a very good um, presentation by the EPA um, and giving their blessing to the use of amendments for dealing with uh, contaminants at sediment sites. So this is a good reference if you're looking at, uh, at using contaminants and want to convince regulators that you know, this is for real, this is something which is, which is out there, it's scientifically uh, a credible way to deal with contaminants and sediments. And late last year, the EPA also put out a, a document where they did a review of the Superfund program and came up with a few plans for the, the Superfund program moving forward. And one of, the, one of the specific items that they identified was to encourage the use of amendments to reduce bioavailability at contaminated sediment sites. And this was primarily because they recognized that the country couldn't afford to dredge all the contaminated sediment sites that were present around the United States. And they said, we have to find an alternate way and using amendments to reduce bioavailability is recognized as being an appropriate way to, um, uh, to, to, to manage these risks. And then another document, whole list of documents here that came out of the ITR, ITRC just uh, this past summer. A number of us at, at Geosyntec were on the team which prepared this document as well, uh, is the framework for evaluating remedies for contaminated sediment sites. And this is a, a good document for um, evaluating what alternatives are out there. And the next few slides I'm going to show show the, the main alternatives for dealing with contaminated sediments. They're well defined in this, in this document and include a lot of options for in situ treatment and the use of amendments. This is the basic structure of the, um, the options that are generally considered for dealing with contaminated sediments. And over here on the, uh, the left-hand side, we have our uh, monitored natural recovery processes of basically just leaving things as they are, monitoring what's going on, and the mechanisms that we, uh, that we can rely on for those for MNR, monitored natural recovery, are just natural processes of absorption, sequestration, maybe natural degradation processes, maybe de natural deposition of clean sediment on top of contaminated sediment, and that's a way to, an important way that uh, risks are reduced at contaminated sediment sites. And then there's just dilution and dispersion type processes, which also reduce, that reduce the risk. And then there's a, a term which has been, um, uh, been used for a number, for a few years now, called enhanced monitored natural recovery. And this is really just taking those same processes that would occur naturally and looking at fairly simple, inexpensive ways of enhancing those processes. So we're relying on the same things. We're relying on absorption and sequestration, but we're adding some amendments to enhance absorption or sequestration. We may be adding amendments to enhance the natural degradation of contaminants in sediment. Or we may be using things like uh, thin layer capping, and that's really just a process of accelerating the deposition of clean sediment 
and it's accelerating a natural process. We're not putting a, a thin layer cap is a thin cap with a maybe six or eight inches of, of sand material to cover up contaminated sediment, and it's really just a way of accelerating a natural deposition process. And as we move over, they identified in situ treatment as a as a different alternative, but it's really the same thing as the enhanced, enhancing the natural uh, recovery processes. We may be adding amendments to sequester. We may be adding biodegradation. With in situ treatment, we may also be doing in situ solidification and stabilization of contaminants and sediments. That's one thing that isn't in the enhanced monitored natural recovery process. And then this document also talks about amended capping, which is very, very similar, but it's just adding amendments to sand, which you then add to the top of the sediment. But these amendments are doing the same things that they might do if they were added directly to the sediment. They're encouraging absorption or sequestration, or they're enhancing degradation, or they may be just isolating the contaminants from, from the environment to reduce, to reduce the risk, to reduce the bioavailability and the risk. And in this, this figure here, these other alternatives to the to further to the right, removal is dredging, is hydraulic and mechanical dredging, or excavation, which means you're actually putting a coffer dam and drying things out and dredging it. Those are those are very expensive alternatives compared to uh, the other ones that include um, include the amendments. And this is just a slide that gives some rough ideas of the relative costs of um, of, of using these different approaches. And these, I apologize, these are in U.S. dollars, and per cubic yard of contaminated sediment, you'd be working in cubic meters, uh, but it gives, you, it gives you an idea of the relative costs of the different approaches. And uh, if we can do things like thin layer capping or use some simple amendments, we're looking at significant, significantly less expensive alternatives than, than dredging. And we're also avoiding the, the short-term risks of distributing contaminants, and from a sustainability perspective, we're also generating a much much smaller carbon footprint for the for the remedy so from a um, a green remediation perspective these in situ treatment alternatives are much are much better as well um, so if we want to implement um, I'm calling it enhanced monitor natural recovery but it really applies to all of these absorption or degradation remedies there's things that we need to know first of all we need to understand how the natural processes work to reduce the risk. We need to do this so that we can predict future concentrations and risks that might occur in the future. And then it also allows us to understand how we can evaluate these, how we can enhance these processes with enhanced monitored natural recovery uh, processes that we, that we may want to implement. And enhancing these processes, as I've discussed, may involve adding amendments for absorption and sequestration. We might, may modify the geochemistry, the redox conditions, or we may add nutrients and, or address microbial limitations to encourage biodegradation of contaminants in the, in the sediment. So we need to understand the natural processes and then we can learn how to use those processes. And that's where the treatability testing comes in and that's how we've gotten involved in the sediment work in our, in our office here in Guelph in particular. Uh, we've been doing treatability testing for groundwater remediation for a number of years, developed uh, a number of um, bioremediation cultures and a number of approaches to, uh, to, to, to in situ treatment of contaminants in primarily in groundwater and soil. And over the last four or five years, we've been doing more and more of these tests for contaminated sediments. So doing tests in a lab lets us understand the natural processes that are going on. It lets us evaluate a whole bunch of different alternatives, different amendments. It lets us generate data that we need to gain acceptance for this in situ treatment. We need to be able to show regulators and other stakeholders how these processes work and demonstrate that we have a good understanding of what's going on. And it provides data that we need to support the design of these systems. And with the treatability lab, we have the, the treatability lab integrated with the, with the project team. We're doing the work in, all in one place. Uh, there are some universities that we collaborate on, on certain work, but we find that doing the work in-house in a consulting environment where we're directed towards dealing or addressing with a client's problems lets us uh, focus on the issues at hand and, and we're not distracted by research that some universities, some university uh, treatability studies are, are, are run into. So some of the things that we've done in our lab, looking at, uh, at sediments in particular, we've done a lot of work on biodegradation of, of chlorinated organics, uh, a lot of chlorinated benzenes and PCBs in, uh, in sediments. 
biodegradation of, of uh, petroleum hydrocarbons, BTEX compounds, PAHs. We've done a lot of work with uh, evaluating the absorption of uh, contaminants like PCBs and PAHs with activated carbon. Uh, we've developed um, approaches to buffering pH of some waste material at, at several sites where uh, there's elevated pH, and we have some mineral amendments that we can use to buffer the pH down to, uh, to closer to neutral ranges. And then the testing work that I'll talk specifically about later in the, in the slides here is absorption sequestration for uh, PCBs and mercury uh, with activated carbon and, and other amendments where we've got a site where we've got PCBs and mercury and uh, had some challenges with approaches to, uh, to amendments but have developed an approach that, uh, that seems to work well for that mixture of, uh, of contaminants and sediments. And then I'll talk briefly about um, pilot testing. This is normally the next stage of, of taking something from the treatability lab. We can figure out what, what things work and then we take it out to the field. This is a picture from uh, work that we've done at the Berries Creek site. Uh, a large Superfund site in New Jersey. And the pilot test, testing lets us understand the impacts of field conditions, um, understand constructability issues and implement implementation issues, uh, evaluate um, uh, geotechnical issues and stability. That's a big deal when we're looking at, at sediment capping and, and adding amendments. And as another step in gaining acceptance from, uh, from stakeholders on using in situ treatment. Uh, and now I'm going to jump and talk to talk about amendments for absorption and sequestration of contaminants in sediment in general, and then I'll talk specifically about the work that we did on on this one on this one project. Um, so amendments that have been used at at the full at full scale at, at a number of sites. Uh, the one that's been used the most is is activated carbon as an amendment, either added directly to sediment or as part of a sediment cap. Um, other other um, Carbon-based amendments can be used. People have been using biochar uh, and some other organic material, but activated carbon is, seems to be one of the best, the best absorbent material. Uh, does a very good job of, of sequestering organics in, um, in contaminated sediment. Um, organoclay is another material which has been used to deal with, with NAPL, with non-aqueous phase liquids uh, that may be present in, um, in sediment. It has a very high absorption for pure phase liquid for napples, um, also has some ability to absorb uh, dissolved organics and, and some metals as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about, about that material. And then we've also used um, siderite as a, as a mineral and it's effective for buffering high pH pore waters. And we've used that effectively at uh, uh, the Onondaga Lake site, a large sediment site with, um, with some solve waste material in a lake that was generating high pH. So the first thing I talked about was activated carbon, and uh, activated carbon is used quite routinely in water treatment for absorbing um, hydrophobic organic compounds, PCBs, PHs, pesticides, things like that. Um, and as well, uh, fluorinated compounds, or um, activated carbon is used successfully in treating those, those contaminants, and it works well in sediment, just adding it to the sediment. It absorbs these, the, these contaminants, keeps them from moving into the food chain. It reduces the pore water concentrations and the bioavailability and the and ultimately the exposure. And this is a, a graph just to show um, what activated carbon does and, and how it works. This is from a lab study that was done using um, actual worms, that, the little benthic organisms that live in, in the sediment. And uh, this is a bucket of sediment from a contaminated site with PCBs, and they put the worms in. And after seven days, 14 days, 21 days, and, and 28 days, they took some of the worms out and put them in a grinder and measured the concentrations of PCBs in the worms. And over a period of, of four weeks, they, the worms were taking up the PCBs. They were incorporating them into the biomass, into the worms. So the PCBs would then, the worms would get eaten by the fish and the PCBs would move up, up into the food chain. Uh, but when activated carbon is added as an amendment to the bucket, basically the PCBs are bound up on the activated carbon and the worms don't take up the PCBs. The PCBs are still there. The worms are still swimming around in the sediment where the PCBs are present, but they're not getting into the worm because they're stuck on the PCBs. And this is the, the basic concept of, of, of what we're doing with, uh, with activated carbon as a, as a sediment amendment. Um, there's some pictures here from um, uh, application of activated carbon at a site in Norway. This is a, a barge. You can see a backhoe moving um, 
It's actually activated carbon incorporated into some other capping material, but it's moved onto the barge and added to the uh, added to the um, to the water in the the front of this uh, the spreader system, kind of like the fertilizer spreader I use on my on my lawn at home. And this is GPS controlled and runs back and forth and spreads a nice thin layer of this uh, of this capping material amended with activated carbon. And then it binds up with the the PCBs in the in the sediment and reduces the bioavailability and the risks associated with the PCBs in the sediment. Um, activated carbon has also been used in uh, other pellet systems. This is um, a product called Sedamite, which contains activated carbon in a little in a little pellet, uh, and which contains a clay binder and activated carbon, and it's just spread around um, over the over the sediment. And this material is distributed in the sediment by the naturally, by the benthic organisms, little worms that are living in the sediment that dive down and, and they will distribute the, the activated carbon and uh, spread it around and the activated carbon binds up with the, the contaminants and reduces the bioavailability of, of the contaminants in the sediment. Uh, the organoclay that I talked about is a, um, a natural clay material which is chemically modified so that it has a, a surface which will is organophilic, will absorb uh, napple and other organics, and it's capable of absorbing um, very high about about its own weight in napple material. So if you've got free napple uh, in, as a contaminant, this is a good material to absorb up, soak up that napple like a sponge, and reduce the the availability of that to to organisms and reduce the mobility of the napple in the in sediment in sediment situations. Um, so a lot, a lot of different ways to apply organoclay um, can be added just uh, as a bulk material to contaminated sediment. Uh, can be added. This is a, the picture that I've got here is showing organoclay, which is incorporated into a commercial product called Aquagate. So again, it's a, it's a, together in a binder and uh, is added to the uh, to the site, and then the the binder material falls apart, and the um, organoclay can do its can do its work. Um, the organ organoclay or activated carbon can also be used in a reactive core mat or something called a marine mattress. And these are basically two layers of geotextile fabric with a reactive material, either organoclay or activated carbon or something like that in between. And it's stitched together to make this nice mat that's about, um, about a centimeter or three quarters of a centimeter thick. And this can be just rolled out and provide a, a layer of, of reactive material on top of the contaminated sediment. These are some pictures from a site where um, the, these reactive core mats were applied. A uh, very large area, this was with activated carbon. So this was a way of getting the activated carbon layer down on top of the contaminated sediment. And you can see some pictures of the, of the process of, of getting it down. These reactive core mats are quite, form quite an effective layer, but they are quite expensive relative to just bulk application of activated carbon. So sites where we're working at now, we tend to look at options which just involve spreading of bulk material rather than the use of the, of the reactive core mat just because of, a, uh, because of cost considerations. Um, and then we're looking at um, using amendments for, for metals, for uh, a number of metals. The bulk of the work that we've done has been on mercury. Uh, it's a contaminant which is present at a lot of, a lot of sediment sites. And uh, there's been some research work and the work that we've done in our treatability lab using various iron amendments to sequester, uh, sequester mercury. And we can also sequester other metals, zincs and things like that, that may be present in, uh, in contaminated sediments. And I'll talk about the, uh, some of the results of the work that we've done with, with these materials. Um, so that's kind of the, the general, general overview introduction to the use of, um, use of amendments for contaminated sediments. And now I'm going to go on to uh, talk about treatability testing that we've done for, um, for sediment amendments for, uh, for PCBs and mercury. And this is being done at a, a site, um, uh, the Berries Creek site in New Jersey in uh, the United States where there's a mixture of contaminants, the primary drivers are PCBs and, and mercury. And uh, we conducted these, this test to evaluate a variety of amendments to see how well they would reduce the concentrations of PCBs and mercury in pore water. And the, uh, the, the, we're doing this work in the lab, let us screen a variety of different amendments to see how well they work. And eventually we've taken uh, the ones that worked well, we've taken them out to the field in a, in a pilot program. 
Um, so what we did is we, we started out by preparing uh, one liter microcosm bottles. We got several buckets of uh, contaminated sediment and water from the site, put them in a mixing, mixing tank, uh, mixed it up, and then we filled up um, about 100 jars with, uh, with this contaminated sediment in water, and that was our, was our base material. And uh, then what we did, these are pictures in, the, in our anaerobic glove box of the jars, and we added amendments to, uh, to the different jars. We added them at different dose levels, and we did triplicates of all of our, of all of our treatments to evaluate the statistical significance of, of what we were doing. Uh, we had controls where we didn't do anything, and we had jars that we, uh, that we treated, and we compared the, the concentrations that we measured in, of, of PCBs and mercury and methyl mercury in the pore water in the jars where we had added the amendments to the jars where we had were the controls where we didn't add any amendments. We did this over over an eight-week period, and it was done under anaerobic conditions to simulate the the redox conditions that are present in sediment below the top few few centimeters of, of sediment. And this is uh, a slide showing some of the uh, some of the results. These are really just the positive results. There were a number of other amendments we we evaluated that didn't do quite as well, but these are the ones that worked well, and we carried forward into the next phase of work. And uh, the sedimite material here was, uh, as I said before, was a, a commercial product that contained 50% powdered activated carbon. And it was very effective at reducing the concentrations of, of PCBs. We had greater than 99% reduction in the con of the concentrations of PCBs in these microcosm jars compared to the controls uh, when we added the sedimite activated carbon. So it was quite clear that this was a this was a very good very good material for uh, reducing the bio, the pore water concentration and bioavailability of uh, of PCBs. Then we had some other material, organoclay um, MRM, which is a special commercial product designed to absorb metals. Um, it re reduced the methyl mercury, but not the mercury. And uh, there's some reasons for that. I won't get into that here for just for time purposes, but. Then we had other iron-based amendments using uh, Azorbster, which was a commercial product that contained some iron and other metals, um, Siderite, which is an iron carbonate, and zero-valent iron, which performed quite well in reducing the mercury and methyl mercury. These things didn't do anything for the, the PCBs. Um, so in the next phase, we mixed the sedamite with the other iron amendments to see how well we could get all of the contaminants removed with one, um, with one amendment combination or cocktail. Um, so I'm going to jump to the second phase of treatability testing, with the more interesting results here, where we were looking at the simultaneous re reduction of PCB concentrations and, and mercury with a, with a mixture of, of amendments. And we use the same approach that we used in the phase one. We just used different combinations of amendments, and uh, we did one dose of amendments that we'd identified in the, in the first phase of work. So the things that we looked at here, we looked at the sediment with sedamite, product with powdered activated carbon because we wanted to take out the, uh, the PCBs, and then we looked at um, adding sulfur. There were some suggestions that sulfur may, may work to get rid of the mercury, um, the organoclay material, and some various forms of, of iron and iron with sulfur to evaluate the effectiveness of, of removal of, of, our, of our mercury along with the PCBs. And these are the results that we had for removal of PCBs. This, is, this graph shows the concentrations of PCBs in the pore water in our control jar. That's the bar over here on the left. And you can see that we had uh, constant, measurable con concentrations of PCBs in the pore water. And in all of the microcosms where we added the powdered activated carbon in the sedamite, we dropped the PCB concentrations down to, to non-detect. So we're able to virtually completely eliminate the PCBs from the pore water which, as we saw from the, from the earlier slides, reduces the bioavailability, reduces the uptake into the worms, stops the PCBs from getting up into the food chain, which is what we, uh, what we want to do with our, with our amendments. Um, and the next slide shows what we're getting with the mercury. Um, our iron amendments were given. This is the same, same setup on this slide on the left-hand side. We have the unamended control. We have the concentration of mercury. And in some of our amendments that didn't work so well, the ones that didn't contain iron, but our amendments which contained iron, and particularly adding the zero-valent iron to the sediment, gave us a, a significant reduction in the, the concentrations of mercury in the, in the pore water, which will reduce the bioavailability of the mercury and stop the mercury from moving up into the food chain. 
And we're also interested in methylmercury in sediment sites. It's the, the form of mercury which gets um, into, into the food chain, and we want to be able to block the production of methylmercury or to sequester the methylmercury. And we saw, you see in this slide that we had a very, a very good reduction of the concentrations of methylmercury in the sediment pore water as well using our iron, uh, using our iron based amendments. And these are the same results, just in a in a pre different table of, of presentation, showing that we had 90, 95, 90, greater than 95 percent removal of PCBs with these amendments, and shows you the removal that we had of mercury and methyl mercury with our with our siderite, our zorbster, which contains some iron, and the best removals with our with our zero valent iron. Um, so what we saw is that sedamite does a good job of removing. Um, PCBs and the ZDI does a good job of, of getting rid of the mercury. So we're able to address all of our contaminants with this mixture of, of amendments. Uh, we also have some data here where we're looking at the geochemistry in the, in the microcosm jars, which helps us understand what's going on and what mechanisms are important for the reduction of, um, of, of the, uh, the, the mercury in particular. And uh, what we're seeing is that we needed, to, when we saw iron, high dissolved iron concentrations in our jars, we saw a very good removal of the, of the mercury. Uh, we also were removing the sulfide, and we believe that this leads us to some of our conclusions about the mechanisms that are, that are at play here. Um, and I'll talk about, talk about these here now. Um, sedamite's effective in reducing PCBs. As I said, the, the iron is removing the mercury and methyl mercury. And based on our geochemical analysis, we believe that we're getting co-precipitation of mercury with iron sulfides, or we're getting some combination of that along with absorption of the iron onto the mineral surfaces. And we believe that the methyl mercury is reduced because the, uh, we're reducing the mercury concentrations in the pore water, and that means that the, the mercury is not bioavailable, bioavailable for the microorganisms that are producing the methyl mercury, um, but we're able to get rid of, to reduce the, the mercury and methyl mercury concentrations with the with these iron amendments. Um, we also demonstrated that sulfur wasn't required to reduce the mercury and methyl mercury. There were some suggestions uh, prior to doing this work that we needed to, to be adding sulfur to this system, but we showed with this work that uh, sulfur is not required as an amendment to get removal of the of the mercury. Um, and then we have our, our best combination was the ZBI and the sedamite with powdered activated carbon where we got removal of PCBs and, and mercury altogether. Um, I've got a few slides here I'm going to show you of the, uh, of the pilot test work that we've done uh, based on this lab work. Uh, we took the, uh, the amendments out to the field and evaluated the performance of just a straight thin layer cap as well as the amendments that we used in the lab for, uh, as part of the thin layer cap. And uh, this is a picture of, of application of this uh, the cap, thin layer cap on some mudflat areas at the, at the Berries Creek in New Jersey. This is a, an application of the thin layer cap. This is done at low tide. At high tide, this area is, is flooded up to the base of the, uh, of the marsh, up into the marsh plants here. This is a, a telebelt conveyor belt system, telescoping conveyor belt system that's used to bring the, the mixture of sand and amendments out to be placed on the, um, on the contaminated sediment. This is what, what it looked like um, after the, the application of the sediment, or of the, of the thin layer cap. This is what it looks like after the tide has been up and down, and we're actually seeing deposition of, um, of new sediment on top of the cap in this situation. It returns to look like it was, but there's a layer of sand beneath that thin layer of new, new sediment that's landed on, on top there. Um, we've done, we're in the process of doing monitoring of this system, evaluating the reestablishment of the benthic community, and we're doing measurements of poor water for PCBs and for mercury to evaluate the performance of the, of the cap material in addressing the, uh, in, in reducing the poor water concentrations in the, in the sediment cap. So from this uh, pilot testing, we've verified the, uh, the design approach to, to applying the cap. Um, we're integrating what we've learned about um, moving material around to the site and placing it on, on the, uh, the, the sediment into our design of our full scale. We evaluated several different construction approaches. We learned which ones work, work best, um, understanding more about the site conditions and assessing the, uh, the new technologies, 
and uh, learning about the, the logistics and uh, the cost to apply these, these types of, of sediment caps. Um, so just a quick quick summary slide here, what we talked about in, uh, in the United States, we're seeing an increasing acceptance of uh, the use of amendments for risk reduction, and we think that's something which will be translated around the world as well to other, other locations like Australia. Um, for our treatability testing, we evaluated multiple alternatives. Uh, we generated data that's helping us sell this approach to, uh, to regulators, gave us some reproducible and scientifically justifiable site-specific data, and we're using that information to support, uh, support our design. Um, we identified a novel amendment combination, which is effective on both PCBs and on, on mercury, and we've done pilot testing to demonstrate the application methods for, for, this, for this technology. And that's all that I've got in the, the presentation. I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions or chat with folks about, about what we've been doing. Anybody still there? Everybody on, on mute? <laughs> uh, should, if, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can, if, if you're muted, you can unmute yourself by clicking on that little arrow next to your name and uh, selecting unmute. Otherwise, please feel free to use the public chat uh, messenger in the lower left-hand side. Um, Tom, I have one quick question for you. In the, um, in the research for the bind amendment, uh, the most successful one was the sedamite and CVI combination for the mercury, methylmercury, and uh, PCB. Um, the combination that was the next most successful but slightly less involved application of sulfur in that mixture as well. Um, do you have any thoughts on why the combination that included sulfur would have produced a a lesser result than the one that just included ZVI? Um, if we go back to the uh, the geochemistry data, which I didn't talk a lot, put one forward there. Um, there's nothing different that we saw in the, in the geochemistry. Um, yep. It may have been binding up some of the, or using some of the capacity of the zero valent iron. That's, that's sort of our our best, our best guess as to what was going on or why the sulfur um, didn't help. I mean, there were a lot of suggestions that the, the way to take out mercury uh, is to add sulfur and bring out the, the mercury as a mercury sulfide. Um, so people thought that we might need sulfur to do that. We didn't, we didn't need it. In fact, they, they adding the sulfur didn't, didn't help, didn't make things better. And adding sulfur alone didn't do anything for us. Um, so it's the, it, the the iron is the is the important component in uh, in the removal of the mercury. Sure, no, thank you, uh, Tom. I noticed there's a question from Dawit uh, in the in the chat box. Um, yeah. Read those up. Question one: Granular activated carbon is lightweight material uh, and will float when added to water body. Can you please explain how GAC was placed at the bottom of the water body? Yeah, no, that's a good uh, a good question, and a lot of work was uh, was done on that for um, uh, remediation program at Onondaga Lake. And granular activated carbon, if it's been pre-wetted, will actually sink. And at Onondaga Lake, they've um, added activated carbon just directly to the lake, along with a sand cap. And as long if it's dry, if it's you know, dry activated carbon, it will float for a while until it becomes saturated, and then it will sink. But if it's pre-wetted, it can be spread out on the surface of uh, of a lake, um, and it will and it will sink not quite as fast as as sand, uh, but it can be added that way, or it can be added as a component of a product. The sedamite product is um, <clears throat> a little pellet about the size of a pencil eraser that contains half activated carbon and half this clay or bentonite binder to hold it together into a larger particle which will sink very well. So you can, one of the advantages of using the, the sedamite in that little particle is that you can use powdered activated carbon, which you couldn't add directly to a lake. It wouldn't sink by itself. So you need to add powdered activated carbon as a component of, of something like sedamite. But granular activated carbon you can add directly if, if it's been pre-wetted. Sure. 
Okay, no, that's great. Um, that was the <coughs> second question. Excellent reduction on concentration of contaminants. However, the amendments such as GAC will change the turbidity of water and water quality. Have you noticed any secondary effect on water body, flora, and fauna? Um, that's been a, a subject of some, was two parts to that. I guess the first one is the, the turbidity in the water, of wa water and water quality. That's just a short-term um, a short-term effect during placement. And uh, the granular activated carbon that's been used has been wetted and, and washed, so it doesn't have a lot of fine material on it. Um, and usually when this stuff is being placed, it's done with a, with a silt curtain around the area where it's being placed so that any excess turbidity that might come off is contained and has enough time to, uh, to settle. So that's a, that's a pretty small and, and short duration effect. Um, people have looked at the effect of carbon on benthic organisms to see if the carbon absorbs nutrients and, and, and in, or in any other way um, affects the benthic community. And there are some, some very minor effects there, but they've been, they've been studied and they're, they're, they're quite minor compared to, um, uh, compared to issues with the contaminants that are present. Sure. Okay. Uh, and the third question from Dawit was, could you please explain the desorption rate from the amendment in the long term? The expectation is that, that there's really very little desorption or that the rate of desorption is, is very, very slow. Activated carbon is a, is a very good sequestration agent. Um, it will, will eventually come to equilibrium and it can lose contaminants, but it's a very slow process. Sure. Okay. Uh, and there's another question from Rory Lane, and Rory asks, Tom, can you please explain how you carry out the pore water sampling in the field? Um, sure, that's a that's a whole another another topic. In fact, we have a a short course that uh, Matt Vanderkoy, who and Dave Himmelheimer, who's actually was pictured in the life jacket picture there, um, are giving at the Battelle Sediments Conference coming up um, in January this year on measure, methods of measuring um, measuring sediment pore water concentrations. Uh, there's a lot of different devices. It's difficult to collect poor water in the same way you collect groundwater by putting in a well and just drawing water in because you tend to collect water very slowly. Sediment tends to be quite, um, quite have, have a low permeability, so it's difficult to collect water samples um, directly. Um, a lot of work has been done, and we've, we collect samples using uh, things called peepers, which are basically passive samplers. Um, they have a membrane water inside and have a membrane on the outside and the water comes to equilibrium with the pore water and those are used for certain contaminants. And for things like PCBs, we're using um, PDMS type passive samplers, which are just small amounts of plastic material basically that absorb uh, organic contaminants like PCBs and we can just push them into the sediment they soak up the PCBs over a period of two or three weeks into this solid phase material, and then we pull them out again and we extract the PCBs from that material, and then we can calculate what the pore water concentrations were based on uh, the measurements that we get in these, um, these solid, uh, solid absorbent materials. Sure, okay, thank you. Uh, and I've just been emailed through a question from John Hunt who asks, when adding amendments oh, to a I'm, I'm going to, um, I have to yep. turn the alarm off. Excuse me for just one moment. Yep, yep, no problem. Tom is uh, in the Guelph office after hours, and I think probably just triggered uh, security. <laughs> um, we'll get back to this question as soon as, he, as soon as he's back. Sorry about that. That's one, one drawback of coming here at night to, uh, to give the presentation as our alarm goes on automatically at 10 o'clock. I have to turn it off. Uh, <laughs> no problem. Uh, just the, the final question I had here was from John Hunt, who says, when adding amendments to absorb PCBs and pore water, how do you calculate the dose? And do you have to allow in that calculation for subsequent desorption of PCB from the sediment? Uh, yes, that's certainly... Um, uh, there are equilibrium isotherms that are done that are sort of the starting point for evaluating the dose rates. So people that do a lot of this work in um, activated carbon for treatment of, of water systems, 
and that's the starting point to assess the, the grams of contaminant that you need or that will absorb onto a, a gram of, uh, of activated carbon. For, um, for sediment, it's more, it can be a little more complicated because there's lots of organics in the sediment that can take up the sorts sites on the activated carbon. So um, we need, that's why the treatability testing is a useful component to measure the actual absorption capacity of carbon in sediment situations. So it's really just, it, 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 it's empirical based on, um, there's calculations we can do, but we'd rather do the empirical treatability testing to evaluate the, uh, uh, the, the absorptive capacity. At, at some sites like Onondaga Lake, for example, they had to design their cap to, uh, to account for upwelling of sediment pour water, groundwater basically discharging into the lake and flowing up through the sediment cap for a period of a thousand years. So they needed to add enough activated carbon to address the, the migration of contaminants from groundwater up through the bottom of the lake. Okay, well thank you, Tom. Um, just keeping an eye out, are there any last questions before we wrap up today? I'll just note again that we are recording this webinar. We will also make available a PDF version of Tom's slides for anyone who's interested. I'll follow up with everyone uh, with an email after this webinar, and if you're interested, just just reply, and I'll and I'll send you a, a PDF copy of the presentation. Uh, and of course, as soon as we sort out how we're going to host these recorded presentations, we'll send you a link. Um, one more question through from Camillo. Can you apply your amendments to any type of water body, uh, i.e. high energy versus low energy? <clears throat> the only situation which really creates a problem are some high energy environments. If you've got a, a very fast flowing river, uh, using amendments is, is, going to be, is going to be challenging. Um, the sites that we've worked on include an Onondaga Lake, which is a, a freshwater lake with a fairly low um, low flow, but we did have to design that for uh, prop wash for boats in certain shallow areas. Uh, there's Hamilton Harbor site where there are some major uh, shipping routes nearby and there's big ships, so they have to, we have to put armor stone down on top of certain areas of, of sediment caps in order to prevent um, the cap from being disturbed by, um, uh, by ships going by. Um, in moving rivers, something like that, um, uh, that mat, that reactive core mat may need to be used in order to get the material down to the bottom of the, of a river and then it might need armor stone on top of that to hold it down. So there are some design approaches, uh, but it's certainly easier in a, in, in a, in a still water body. Or in a, it's the other work that we did, the, the pilot test there was a tidal estuary, um, but the tide the, the flow during tidal, uh, tidal cycles isn't enough to, to be a problem with the, with the cap. That was one of the things that we confirmed during our, our pilot testing in the Berries Creek site. Sure. Okay, we have a, another question through from Prashant who asks, for how long were desorption studies conducted? Did you see any effect of aging on desorption of contaminants? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. and. Uh, those desorption studies have gone on for a couple of years, but this is a relatively new technology, so the studies have been, um, uh, just because we haven't been doing it that long, we, we, we don't know. That is a little bit of an open question about whether activated carbon may, may break down over time, uh, but it's something which is probably in the you know, many decades kind of time frame. Uh, one of the... Uh, uh, Processes, another process that goes on in contaminated sediment sites is deposition of new clean sediment or new sediment on top of the contaminated sediment. And uh, the expectation is that if something like activated carbon does break down over 20, 30, 50 years, something like that, that there's deposition of sediment on top of it. So with that sediment will be buried in the future anyways. But that is still a, is still an open question that is the subject of, of some um, of consideration in uh, the long-term 
uh, monitoring of remedies like this. Okay, well, thank you, Tom. If there's, are there any further questions? If there's, people are, are of course, welcome to send emails through to either myself or, or directly to Tom uh, if you think of anything uh, afterwards that uh, didn't come to mind now. Um, and if you take a PDF copy of the slides, this will be the final slide with our contact details on it, or you can, you can jot down the phone numbers and email addresses now. We're obviously always happy to uh, help answer your questions. Uh, if there aren't any further questions immediately, we might call it a wrap for today. But thank you again to Tom for your presentation, for dealing with alarms going off in your office late at night in order to uh, bring us this great information. Um, thank you, everyone who has uh, attended today and for the last couple of webinars.